And I now invite you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Paul Williamson as he delivers the first of the 39th annual Moore College Lecture Series. Well, thank you, Mark, for inviting me to give these lectures, and thank you for coming uh, to hear them, and I hope you will not be disappointed. In this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. Benjamin Franklin was not the first to draw the analogy, but he probably deserves the credit for the modern idiom, and surely few of us would challenge its validity. Some may evade the tax man for a while, but he catches up eventually. And this is even more so in the case of the Grim Reaper. Some may, late, may wait longer than others, but this is an appointment that we all must surely keep. It's not something that any of us can ultimately avoid. Statistically, one out of one dies. <laughs> Currently, some 56 million every year. That's over 6,000 per hour, over 100 per minute, and almost two every second. And one day you and I will be part of those statistics. Well, that's a rather morbid note on which to kick off this series of lectures. But what did you expect? <laughs> after all, the topic is death and the hereafter. So some pertinent facts about death are surely relevant. Here are a few others I came across as I trawled my way through the internet. Apparently, vending machines kill 13 people per year. <laughs> 600 Americans die each year falling out of bed. <laughs> Obese drivers are almost 80% more likely to die in a car crash. We're all more likely to die in the taxi to and from the airport than in the flight itself. We're also more likely to die from a falling coconut than from a shark attack. So, maybe not in Australia. <laughs> 35 million of the cells in our body die each minute. But don't panic, we have some 50 to 75 trillion, and that most of those are being constantly replaced. And yet, as we all know, the degenerative disease eventually does take over. Our sense of hearing, apparently, is the last thing to go. And within three days of death, the enzymes that once digested your dinner begin eating you. Puts a whole new spin on the meaning of indigestion. <laughs> anyway, while those facts of death may be very interesting, I thought so anyway, the main focus in this lecture series is not actually death itself, it's what lies beyond it. We'll certainly be touching on the nature of death and its significance for us as human beings, but our attention will be directed much more towards the afterlife, or what one author has referred to as life to the sequel. In particular, we'll be examining what the Bible has to say about the life hereafter, but we'll also look at some extra biblical perspectives as well and how these inform, compare, or contrast with the teaching of Scripture. But first, let me explain why we're looking at this particular topic. One of the first books I read as a young Christian was The Bible on the Life Hereafter, written by William Hendrickson. Back then, I wasn't much of a reader, so his three to four page chapters really did appeal to me. So too did his engaging style and his ability to compress so much material into so few words. Anyway, it's fair to say that this book was very formative in my own thinking, especially concerning personal eschatology, the focus of this lecture series. However, while the, the main topics of individual eschatology remain unchanged, some of the issues that we'll be wrestling with are somewhat different. For the most part, Hendrickson was presenting the teaching of scripture over against ideas proposed by heterodox groups or cults such as Jehovah Witnesses. More recently, however, it's not just cults or non-evangelicals who are challenging traditional orthodoxy. Today, such a challenge is coming even from within the evangelical camp. And for the most part, they're questioning issues about which evangelicals have all previously agreed, 
I've lost count of the times that my own convictions on death and the life hereafter have been challenged by ideas that I did not consider to be evangelical orthodoxy. And yet most of the folks that I was interacting with, whether on paper or in person, had a very orthodox view of scripture. They were certainly not challenging or seeking to undermine the Bible's authority. Yet their understanding of personal eschatology was certainly not what I'd picked up from Hendrickson or other people like him in the Dutch Reform camp. While we agreed on the nature of scripture and its authority, we clearly understood the relevant biblical texts quite differently. So that's what led me to focus on this particular subject for our lecture series. Obviously, it presented an ideal opportunity for me to re-examine some of the pertinent issues, and I assume that you might like to explore these with me. Well, as the old adage goes, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Having spent the past six months on little else, I'm no longer quite so sure. Several times, books I picked up began their preface with, in 10 years living with this project, or words to that effect, and they were dealing with just one of my five main topics. Now, that was a bit discouraging, to say the least. It was very tempting to narrow down the focus, to zoom in on one topic in particular, and do a much more detailed study on that. And yet, the more I thought about doing that, the less it appealed to me. Would you really want to sit through five lectures on the state of the dead, <laughs> or the final judgment, or the nature of hell? I suspect not, and more to the point, neither would I, so I didn't think you should either. So for better or for worse, I've, cut, I've stuck with my original plan to examine the five major topics of personal eschatology with a particular eye to significant debate surrounding each of them. So if nothing else, hopefully I won't bore any of you to death or indeed induce any near-death experiences. <laughs> so then, how should we understand the nature of death and what lies beyond it? Is death simply the cessation of life and the end of our existence? Or is there more to it than that? <clears throat> That's an issue, of course, over which our contemporary world is deeply divided. So this is where we'll begin, by considering death and the afterlife in contemporary perspective. According to the opinion polls, there are three main positions on this matter. Some 26% of people remain agnostic on this issue. They aren't really sure what happens after death. Indeed, as far as they're concerned, this is something that no one can really know about. It's impossible to know whether or not there's an afterlife until you're dead. Theoretically, a near-death experience might persuade an agnostic to think otherwise. But then again, this might simply be explained in terms of human subconsciousness or residual electrical activity in the brain or whatever. In any case, a true agnostic would generally plead ignorance. As one blogger puts it, I guess my agnostic theory would be that after we die, we don't know anything anymore. To which another quickly replied, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> For others, death is simply the permanent cessation of all our vital functions, the inevitable end of the biological process that we call life. And as such, death effectively terminates our existence. We die and we're dead. Kaput. Other than fond memories, we hope, and our decomposing corpses, I'm afraid, there's really nothing left of us. In essence, we have ceased to exist. As one avowed atheist claims, the conscious, self, the conscious aware self is established by the structures and processes of the nervous system. If the structures become destroyed and those processes cease, there's nothing left to establish the conscious aware self and we become once more like we were before we were born, non-existent. Or as another puts it, I've always felt that when I die, I'm dead and gone. My conscious life will end, my interactions with others will end, and I will be simply gone. My afterlife will be in the memories of those I knew, those who loved me, those who carry me on in their hearts. I myself cease to exist. However, for most of us, death is not nearly so bleak as that. Rather than being the end of our existence, it's an experience that will instantly or at least ultimately survive. Despite the ardent denial of humanists and rationalists 
Apparently, over half of us, about 51% of us, still believe that there's some form of ongoing existence beyond death. Of course, how we understand this does vary greatly. Some think of such an afterlife in terms of reincarnation, the transmigration of souls, a succession of rebirths, eventually leading to some form of liberation or enlightenment or transcendence. Others think in terms of migration to a supernatural or metaphysical realm from where the dearly departed can still communicate with us and even manifest themselves at times to the living. Still others think in terms of a temporary abode, some kind of interim state where the dead experience joy or pain until a future resurrection and final judgment. Then, of course, there are those who imagine that their lost loved ones become stars or angels. A few months back, I was driving along the Illawarra Road. One, one of those translucent car window stickers caught my attention. But it wasn't the usual one, you know, the stick figures of the nuclear family, two parents, two kids, and a pet dog or whatever. Now, this one actually read, Mary Jones, 1955 to 2015, heaven has gained an angel. Heaven has gained an angel. Some people, it seems, really do believe this concept that has been popularized by Hollywood, that the dead actually become angels. And many others have formed their own rather hedonistic concept of the afterlife. Heaven's perceived as a kind of celestial resort where people indulge their, their, their desires and pursue their personal interests to their heart's content. And that might be professional cricket or soccer or whatever pleasure they prefer. And then for those with a more austere notion of heaven, well, hell's where you go for the company rather than for the climate. Clearly not all who express such ideas take the afterlife too seriously, but apparently some do and take false comfort in these kinds of popular sentiment. So as far as our contemporary world is concerned, there's a wide range of perspectives on this important question of death and the afterlife, even among those who believe in the latter. Perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that the situation wasn't all that dissimilar in the ancient world, to which we will now turn our attention. We'll confine our attention here to the various cultures that arguably had some bearing on Israelite or Jewish culture, and hence on the biblical teaching concerning death and the afterlife. Thus, we'll first consider attitudes to death and the afterlife in the ancient Near East, and then we'll have a look at the attitudes reflected in the Greco-Roman world. So first of all, then, death and the afterlife in the ancient Near East. The idea of survival beyond death was ubiquitous in the ancient Near East. As John Walton observes, for them the question was not, is there life after death? No one really doubted this. Rather, their question was, what are the conditions in the afterlife? And how could one improve or achieve more desirable conditions there? For the most part, the ancient Near Eastern concept of the afterlife was rather gloomy. Their netherworld was filled with monsters and demons. Negotiating through this to a better afterlife entailed all kinds of difficulties. It also required significant assistance from the living. As is well known, death and the afterlife were very important issues in ancient Egypt. Indeed, one might reasonably infer that the Egyptians were almost obsessed with such. However, this was not because they had a morbid fascination with death itself. Rather, it stemmed from their desire for a pleasant afterlife. They wished to ensure that they could enjoy in the hereafter what they had cherished in the here and now. Ancient Egyptians, therefore, devoted more attention to death and beyond than any other ancient civilization. But their, their beliefs developed and changed over time. Indeed, their ideas were never necessarily uniform at any given point in time. Like other ancient Near Eastern religions, they didn't have a systematic theology. So this makes it difficult to summarize the core ideas of their eschatology. But at the risk of gross oversimplification, let me offer a brief synopsis. Egyptian anthropology was very complex. A person consisted of various elements, all of which had to be sustained and protected from harm in order for that person to enjoy a happy afterlife. 
Two of these elements, the life force or energy and the personality, were thought to go to the underworld when a person died. The ka or life force not only survived death, but it was able to eat and drink and smell. Lots of the things that it could do in the present life, if you like. Like the ka, the ba, or the personality would periodically return to the corpse. Indeed, it couldn't survive without the corpse. For this reason, the, mum, the, the body had to be preserved intact, intact, and therefore the practice of mummification. Moreover, the remains had to be recognizable by the roaming alter ego, the ba. Thus, the tomb was marked by identifying inscriptions, and the deceased face was often painted on the mummy's head covering. But as well as these necessary steps in halting decomposition and ensuring the recognition of one's corpse, various items necessary for the afterlife were deposited in the tomb, either the physical realities themselves or simply pictures of such. Most importantly, numerous spells were considered necessary for a successful journey through the underworld. This was thought to be very perilous terrain, beset by malevolent beings and dire situations. Originally, the magic spells that secured safe passage appeared on the walls of the pyramids. They later evolved into coffin texts, inscriptions written on tomb walls and in coffins. And they were also written on sheets of papyrus. And eventually, these formed a corpus of roughly 200 chapters that comprised the now infamous Book of the Dead. At least, it's infamous if you've watched the, the movie The Mummy, or its sequel. That's just a Hollywood prop. That's not the real thing. <laughs> the ultimate trial that one faced in the underworld was the judgment of the dead. For this, the deceased was escorted by the jackal-headed Anubis to the courtroom of Osiris. After asserting one's innocence by a negative confession of various sins and taboos that one had not done, the deceased's heart was placed on a scale, and there it was weighed against the feather of truth. Should the heart be heavier than the feather, it, along with the entirety of the deceased person, would either be devoured by the ravenous hybrid creature that sat beside the scales, or else, according to other texts, the condemned would be drowned or cast into a place of unremitting darkness and stagnation, where the dead walked upside down, consumed urine and excrement, and were tortured by fire and snakes. Rather unpleasant, to be sure. Either way, whether one was banished into outer darkness or simply annihilated, this second death was the worst fate imaginable. By contrast, the blessed dead, those whose hearts proved no heavier than the feather of truth, they were transported across a stream by a boatman to the blissful realm of Osiris and Ra, with whom they would be forever united. During the night, they would go down into the underworld to join the Osiris part of themselves, in a state of perfect completion and repose. During the day, they'd live in the sky, the primary home of the gods. Here, they'd enjoy immeasurable abundance and pleasure in a place where each had a personal spot of ground with an inexhaustible harvest. This place is variously referred to as the field of reeds or the field of offerings or the isles of the just or the great city. To assist the dead on their journey to such a happy afterlife, Family members had a number of significant responsibilities. To start with, they'd obviously to ensure that the corpse was properly preserved and that all the required funeral rituals were duly carried out. This included placing the aforementioned magical spells along with the mummified body to ensure successful navigation through the underworld. It also entailed the all-important opening of the mouth ceremony which allowed the mummy to receive its protecting spirit as well as its food offerings. Such care of the dead had also to be maintained by way of ongoing care of both the tomb and the dead themselves. Failure to carry out such duties would evoke the ire of the deceased ghost, who would then begin meddling malevolently in the affairs of the living. So Egyptians feared not just death itself, but also the dead who could be sought for help, but who could also be blamed for harm. So for ancient Egyptians, death was a rather ominous prospect. Nevertheless, with adequate preparation, assistance, and most especially the proper use of magic, 
a blessed afterlife was considered attainable. The prospect of the afterlife was not quite so attractive further north in Syria, Palestine. Information about the eschatology of the indigenous peoples there is gleaned largely from the Rashamra texts. These were discovered early last century in the ruins of ancient Ugarit. At Ugarit, death was personified as the god Mot, perceived in terms of an insatiable abyss that swallowed up mortals, as well as the fertility god, Baal. According to Ugaritic myth, a perpetual conflict raged between these two deities, between life and death. This was reflected in the, the seasonal cycle experienced here on Earth. But while Mot and Baal periodically return from the underworld, death appears to be the mightier of the two, and there's only the slightest hint of anything positive about the afterlife. It was believed that at death, a person's spirit left through his nose like a gust of wind. The remains were buried under one or more homes and shared tombs. The netherworld to which the departed spirits descended was perceived in terms of vast underground cave, and its royal denizens were described as divinized beings or gods. These were ruled over by the sun goddess Shafash. The Ugaritic texts also refer to the deified ancestors or heroes who reside in the underworld as Rapi Uma, a term closely related to the Hebrew word Rephaim, which likewise refers to the spirits or shades of the dead in some Old Testament texts. As in most of the ancient Near Eastern world, libations and offerings were presented to these dead ancestors in order to secure blessing in this life. In connection with this, some understand the Ugaritic Marzuku festival as a funeral festival for departed ancestors, an expression of the so-called cult of the dead. However, it may arguably reply, refer simply to a drunken banquet, more akin to some Irish wakes, if associated with the dead at all. In any case, it appears that the most positive thing that one could hope for in the, in the Ugaritic concept of the afterlife was the opportunity to eat and drink with the deity. But this was only possible if a living relative carried out the appropriate ritual and all the sacrificial provision. Still, even this was positively upbeat in comparison to the afterlife envisaged in Mesopotamia. As far as a bleak and negative afterlife was concerned, Mesopotamia is pretty much unmatched. With rare exceptions, death was considered the lot of every human being and immortality was a forlorn hope. This point is highlighted in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here, Utnapishtim, the Noah-like hero who survived the flood, was granted immortality. But even Gilgamesh, his heroic descendant, was denied such immortality. Indeed, he was also robbed of the opportunity to be rejuvenated to youthful vigor. The lesson for, less, for lesser mortals seems fairly clear. In death, a person gave up their breath and became a ghost. The body of the deceased was sometimes buried under a special section of their own house rather than in a separate tomb. As in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, the oldest son was responsible for maintaining such duties as providing the dead with food and drink and any other necessary supplies. He was also expected to regularly pronounce their names in order to ensure that the dead weren't forget, forgotten by the living. Particularly important in this regard was the Kipsu banquet to which dead ancestors would be invited and from whom blessing on the living would be sought. As in other ancient Near Eastern thought, the living could make contact with the dead and the ghosts of the dead could affect the circumstances of the living. Restless ghosts were considered particularly malevolent and were thus especially feared. <coughs> Accordingly, imitative magic and numerous spells were designed to ward off such malevolent ghosts or demons, such as those thought to attack people sexually at night, or those who were considered responsible for what we would refer to today as SIDS, uh, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Uh, the underworld itself was commonly referred to as the Great City, the Great Below, or the Land of No Return. It was believed to have three tiers. The lowest level was the court of the gods of the underworld. The middle level was the watery realm of the deity Apsu, 
On the upper level, immediately under the earth's surface, was the residence of the spirits of men. The entrance was considered to be in the west, where Shamas, the sun god, was believed to go down at night, travel onto the earth before resurfacing the next morning in the east. In order to access the underworld, the dead had to cross a river with the aid of a boatman who was called Remove Hastily. Presumably, the sooner he carried out his job, the better for everyone concerned. The grim reality of the underworld is graphically depicted in the Gilgamesh epic as follows. To the house which none leave, who have entered it. On the road from which there is no way back. To the house wherein the dwellers are bereft of light. Where dust is their fur and clay their food. They are clothed like birds with wings for garments and see no light residing in darkness. Other texts speak of vermin and worms feeding on the soul, souls becoming bird-like, and the underworld having seven gates with bars, bolts, and demonic gatekeepers, all suggesting no hope of escape. A slightly more tolerable scenario is envisaged in some parts of the epic for the brave and the virtuous, and especially for those with numerous sons. Presumably this was to ensure that the dead were duly honored by the living. In any case, there seems to be no concept of escaping from the grave or any hope of a blessed afterlife such as the Egyptian field of reeds or the Greek Elysian fields. A much more positive eschatology is reflected in Persia, the last of the ancient Near Eastern cultures to which the Israelites were exposed. According to Zoroastrianism, the main religion of pre-Islamic Persia, humans have bodies which resides the obvious corporeal parts are composed of four invisible aspects, life or vitality, soul, light, and spirit. On the third day after death, the soul ascends for judgment to a mythical mountain at the center of the earth. Here, it's good and bad thoughts, words and deeds are weighed in a balance. If the good outweighs the bad, the soul successfully crosses the bridge of the separator and ascends to heaven. If, however, the bad outweighs the good, this broad bridge radically contracts and the soul plunges into a hellish underworld where a satanic figure presides over retributive punishment. Subsequently, the bodies of both the blessed and the damned are resurrected and the departed spirits are re-embodied for final judgment. For this molten metal will erupt from the mountains to form a river of fire. Both the re-embodied souls, as well as those still alive at this time, must pass through this flowing infer inferno. The good will be saved through divine intervention, whereas the body and soul of the wicked will either be consumed and perish, or will be purged of all corruption. This river of fire will then flow into hell, which it will purge by destroying the satanic figure and his demonic horde, and thus evil will finally be eradicated. The blessed will then share in a meal that will make their bodies immortal and they will live forever in the kingdom of God on a perfected earth resembling a botanical garden, a paradise. That's from the Persian that we get our English word, paradise. Death in the afterlife in the Greek or Roman world. When it comes to ancient Greek notions of death and the afterlife, not only are there numerous different sources, there's also a plethora of conflicting views, often within the same source. For some, this suggests that the authors didn't really take or intend their readers to take these afterlife descriptions too seriously. More likely, however, it was simply a case of not taking the imagery literally. They wanted them to take it seriously, but not literally. There's every indication that they fully intended readers to take the material seriously, especially with respect to the lessons that should be drawn out from it, with respect to the life lived here and now. While some form of Platonism was quite common by the first century, not all were radical dualists like Plato, who is often credited with the concept of dualistic anthropology. However, as is clear from what we've seen already, distinguishing between a mortal body and surviving aspects such as a soul was technically not an innovation of Greek philosophers at all. So we should probably be a little more cautious about dismissing all forms of dualistic anthropology 
as being inherently platonic. In any case, not even philosophers, not even all the philosophers embraced the platonic view of the immortality of the soul. Some, like Aristotle, were much closer to what today would be labelled physicalists or materialists. As such, they viewed death as terminal. Like the majority of atheists in our own day, they understood death simply to be the end of human existence. Reflections on death and the afterlife in the Roman period generally continued along the lines of the Greeks. For some, Hades, or Pluto as it was known, was the, the post-mortem destiny for most people, including fallen heroes. Others embraced the platonic concept of death releasing immortal souls from their bodily imprisonment, or the hope that those living noble lives would be rewarded with an uh, eternal home in the heavens. But then some mocked any idea of individual post-mortem survival viewing death simply in terms of annihilation. Rejection of an afterlife is associated with both Epicureans and Stoics, although Stoicism was much less uniform in this respect. Epicureans typically denied the after, any afterlife whatsoever. They suggested that when we exist, death is not present. But when death is present, then we do not exist. It, i.e. death, is nothing either to the living or to the dead, since concerning the former, it does not exist, and concerning the latter, they do not exist. So for Epicureans, death was obviously the complete end of existence. It was therefore nothing to be feared. After all, if one no longer exists, then there's no afterlife, no post-mortem suffering or punishment. Quite simply, there's nothing at all. Probably expressing such a sentiment, a popular tomb inscription read as follows, I did not exist, I do not exist, I do not care. <laughs> Others adopted a less extreme position than this. Neither completely denying the soul's survival with Epicureans, nor completely accepting it with the Platonists. Many Stoics, for example, believed that while the soul was corporeal, all, or at least wise souls, survived death. But unlike the universe, the soul was nevertheless perishable. Thus, it would not survive the fiery conflagration that was understood to recreate the universe periodically. So at the, the next conflagration, souls that had survived death would thus be reabsorbed into the divine soul, and their constituent elements would be redistributed in the new creation. So even for those Stoics who allowed for the survival of the human soul beyond death, this was merely a temporary phenomenon. Death was effectively the end of human existence. At the opposite extreme is the idea of astral immortality and apotheosis. Simply put, this is the idea that people become either stars or gods. While some ancient mythical traditions conceived of such as avoiding the normal experience of death altogether, by the first century such a prospect was viewed as the post-mortem transport of the soul up into the heavenly realms. The idea of identifying the blessed dead with the stars was closely related to the belief that the stars were in fact divine or supernatural beings of some kind. While the precise origins of such astral immortality are unclear, it was already common in the 5th century BC. The Athenian playwright Aristophanes ridiculed what people say, that when we die, we straight away turn into stars. He obviously thought that idea was nonsense. Despite such ridicule, such an idea seems to have become immensely popular in the Hellenistic era, as attested by numerous epitaphs. According to the Roman philosopher Cicero, in the first century BC, the proper home of the virtuous soul is among the stars in the Milky Way. There he thought a special place is reserved for statesmen who had served their country well. Obviously people like himself, no doubt. Deification of heroes or rulers was a common idea in the Hellenistic world. Not surprisingly, Alexander the Great was thought to have been granted such apotheosis. And this idea was readily adopted by Roman emperors, some of whom admittedly jumped the gun, claiming such divine status even prior to death. 
But for the most part, such apotheosis was acknowledged by a posthumous ceremony and reflected in various symbolism, such as releasing an eagle from a cage on the top of the, the funeral pyre. The idea of being carried into heaven on the back of an eagle is reflected, for example, on the central detail in the Arch of Titus. If you look carefully at the next slide, uh, uh, Titus there is sitting on the back of an eagle. You can just about see the, the eagle's wings. While the concept of apotheosis was generally restricted to the select few, the prospect of astral immortality seems to have been much more inclusive, thus explaining its broader appeal and evident popularity. Apparently not everyone could aspire to be God, but at least everyone could shoot for the stars. <laughs> the more classical view of the afterlife in terms of the soul's migration to the underworld is usually traced back to Homer in the 8th century BC, the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, these famous epics reflect the following understanding of death and the afterlife. At death, the psyche or the soul, which entered the body at birth, leaves again like a puff of wind. And so long as the deceased has been properly buried, goes to the underworld. Here the dead exist as insubstantial shades or shadows of their former selves, without strength and without pleasure. While normally confined to the realm of the dead, the deceased may occasionally reappear as ghosts who can haunt or communicate with the living. As in the ancient Near East, proper care for the dead was therefore paramount. Indeed, improper care could bring their ghosts back to haunt the negligent because in Greek mythology, the unburied dead were not allowed access into Hades. The latter is portrayed as a remote place, far below the earth, dark and dismal, and utterly devoid of hope. For the most part, all the dead, regardless of social rank or status, are believed to share the same experience. It doesn't matter who you were, you had the same destiny. And this was clearly not a happy one even for the heroic dead. Achilles, for example, remarks that he would rather be a poor servant on earth than lord of all the dead in the underworld. Clearly, he was not enjoying his experience there. Yet this was not perceived as a place of punishment. It was not perceived as a place of retributive justice. Rather, it was simply the grim and gloomy destiny that all men would inevitably share. There was no hope of any physical return from death. The only hope of immortality lay in the sense of making a name for oneself, one that would be perpetually remembered by those on earth. So all in all, Homer's view of death and the afterlife is almost entirely negative. The only exceptions to the universal call of Hades were a select few divinely favored heroes who escaped death by being translated to the Isles of the Blessed. While Greek legends also spoke of a number of characters who are revived from death, this is generally understood as mere resuscitation to mortal life rather than a resurrection to immortality. Between Homer and Plato, there were some significant developments in afterlife thought. Orphism held that after death, the soul returns to the ether or upper atmosphere that human beings are punished for each life before being reincarnated, and that with the appropriate decisions in life, it was possible to ascend to heaven after death, albeit after many reincarnations. Pythagoreans, a closely related group named after the famed mathematician, had a similar concept of the afterlife. They likewise believed in reincarnation and the transmigration of souls. They were probably an important source for some of the key ideas reflected in the influential writings of Plato. Unlike Homer, Plato did not consider death as something to fear, or something to regret. Rather, it was something to be welcomed. After all, it was perceived as the moment when the immortal soul was released from its bodily prison. For Plato, the true self was not the physical body, but the immaterial and immortal soul. Thus, in Plato's thinking, death was something to be desired rather than to be dreaded. In his literary dialogue with Socrates, Plato represents a view of the afterlife that is much more positive than that of Homer. 
souls are much better compensated for their lives on earth. Concepts such as Elysium and Tartarus, which were current back in the Homeric period, are much further developed. The true earth is divided into the following parts. Elysium, Tartarus, the fields of punishment, and the Ashfordale fields. The idyllic Elysian fields are reserved for those who had devoted themselves to living good lives and who were remembered by the living, a key expression of Greek piety. By contrast, Tartarus was a place of terrible suffering. It was reserved for those who had been particularly wicked and self-indulgent in this life. The fields of punishment were for those not quite wicked enough for Tartarus, and the Asphodel fields were really for those who qualified for neither Elysium on the one hand, nor the fields of punishment on the other. Thus, for Plato, the decisions that humans make in life do have lasting consequences. They determine the fate of one soul, at least until its next incarnation. And for Plato, death was not the end. Rather, it was the release of the soul from the prison of the body. In the Roman period, the most exhaustive and detailed account of the underworld is presented by Virgil. His Aeneid, written about two decades before the birth of Jesus, draws heavily on the plot of Homer's Odyssey, but he adjusts various concepts to the thought of his own day, clearly reflecting the influence of Plato. Thus, while the hero descends into the underworld to converse with deceased friends and relatives, the geography of the underworld is defined in terms of various regions, and the specific destiny of the deceased is based on their earthly lives. Encircled by a fiery river, Tartarus is depicted as a place where the wicked are tortured and cry out in anguish. By contrast, Elysium is a fertile and happy place. There souls spend their time wrestling, dancing, feasting, all the time being serenaded by Orpheus on his lyre. Writing at the end of the first century AD, Plutarch's eschatological myths reflect typical Platonic thinking, such as the immortality of the soul and differentiated fates for both the virtuous and the wicked. But Plutarch further develops the depiction of the underworld's conditions, and he dwells in particular on the horrible punishments of the wicked. For instance, he speaks of souls writhing as they are turned inside out and skinned alive. Not sure how a dead person can be skinned alive, but um, I'm sure it's possible. And they're plunged in and out of various metallic lakes, some blazing hot, some freezing cold, but all causing dreadful agonies as the soul is exposed to these different extremities. Elsewhere, however, Plutarch seems to ridicule these ideas, dismissing eternal punishment in Hades as a miserable superstition. Perhaps of particular interest for us is the suggestion that physical death separates the soul and mind from the body, but a second death separates the mind from the soul, making true blessedness possible. I think we can safely conclude that the latter concept had little influence on the book of Revelation. Its concept of the second death is very much more negative. So from this sketchy overview of death and the afterlife in the ancient world, it's clear there was indeed much diversity. But while many of these ancient concepts are antithetical to the teaching of scripture, Others are arguably less so, and some seem to correspond quite closely with biblical eschatology. It's to the latter, therefore, that we now turn. I hear some of you probably saying, at last. <laughs> Technically, I suppose we ought to refer to biblical perspectives. The use of a singular could imply that all the biblical testimony reflects a single unified concept which arguably it does not. As we'll see next week, when we examine some of the key biblical motifs in more detail, God's revelation concerning personal eschatology was revealed progressively over time. Thus, the Old Testament perspective is not necessarily the same as what we're more familiar with from the New Testament. For example, what happens to people immediately after death is probably not perceived in exactly the same way in both Testaments. Indeed, even within the Old Testament, different opinions on this matter are sometimes expressed. Over time, however, clarification is brought to bear on the matter, as with other theological truths such as the Trinity.
And so a fuller understanding of personal eschatology is progressively disclosed until we arrive at a more comprehensive understanding of this in the New Testament. In terms of the latter, the following key ideas have traditionally been understood by Christians in general and by evangelicals in particular. First of all, first key concept, a disembodied existence in an interim or intermediate state between an individual's death and his or her future resurrection. Secondly, the bodily resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked at the time of the parousia, the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Thirdly, a final judgment of both the living and the dead, every human being who has ever lived, according to what they have done during their earthly lives. Fourthly, the never-ending punishment of conscious torment in hell for those who are condemned at this last judgment. And fifthly, the everlasting reward of an immortal life with God for those who have been redeemed and forgiven through faith in Jesus. But as we mentioned earlier, during recent decades, this traditional understanding has been seriously challenged, not by Bible critics, but by those with impeccable evangelical credentials. So let me introduce you to what seem to be some key issues in contemporary evangelical debate. The first of these issues concerns the question of an interim or intermediate state. While this is undeniably the traditional Christian viewpoint, it has been called into question on two main grounds. First of all, it has been dismissed on account of its allegedly platonic anthropology. As mentioned earlier, Plato was largely responsible for introducing a radical dualism, one that devalued the physical body at the expense of the allegedly immortal element the human psyche or soul. Such platonic thinking, it is suggested, lies at the heart of the traditional understanding of an intermediate state. The idea that the relationship between the body and the soul of a human being is temporarily dissolved at death and that the soul goes to a, a non-material realm where it continues to exist in some conscious or some known form. For the philosophical monist, such an idea is simply unacceptable. Rather than thinking of humans in terms of a dualistic anthropology, monists maintain that human beings don't subsist of two separable entities, i.e. a physical body and an immaterial soul. Instead, they think of human beings as an entirely physical entity, so that when the body dies, that's it, nothing survives. The human mind is conceived as simply the processes of the brain. When the latter ceases to function, there is no mind, there is no soul that can possibly survive this experience. Thus, once a person dies, they're simply dead. They're non-existent. And they'll remain this way until the return of Christ, when Jesus will resurrect them. So for evangelicals who embrace this monist anthropology, there is simply no possibility of an intermediate state between death and resurrection. Indeed, there's really no call for such a concept at all. But what then about the biblical texts that seem to suggest otherwise? Well, not surprisingly, the second front on which the traditional understanding of an intermediate state has been challenged is the interpretation of these very texts. Texts such as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 or Jesus' words to the dying thief in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, or the confident hope that Paul expresses of dying and being immediately present with Christ or at home with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, Philippians 1, or the depiction of the souls of Christian martyrs in the presence of God and reigning with Christ in the book of Revelation. It's argued that these and other such proof texts for such an intermediate state have all been misinterpreted. When read in the light of their genre and their literary context, these texts allegedly lend no support to the idea of an interim post-mortem state. Most are referring rather to an eschatological situation that will come into effect after the parousia, when resurrected believers will finally enjoy the presence of Christ forever. Thus, philosophically and exegetically, the notion of an intermediate state has come in for fairly sharp criticism. In Monday's lecture, Death, the Ultimate Separation, question mark, we'll examine the validity of such critique. 
and whether or not there is sufficient grounds to maintain belief in what has become a contentious doctrine. The next issue relates to the eschatological prospect of a resurrection from the dead. In some respects, our future resurrection has always been fairly controversial. After all, even in New Testament times, there were evidently some people denying this prospect. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, 2 Timothy 2, verse 18. Moreover, in the early church, there was significant debate over the precise nature of our resurrection body. So it's probably not surprising that the prospect of our resurrection from the dead should still be the, the subject of theological debate today. In contemporary academic discussion, two issues in particular have drawn scholarly attention. In Old Testament scholarship, the question of the genesis of this idea is a point of some discussion. Contrary to the reigning consensus, that is, the idea that physical resurrection really came on the scene very, very late in Israel's thinking, some have suggested the very opposite, namely that the seeds of this concept are evident much earlier than generally thought. Now, initially, when I was planning this series of lectures, I assumed that that would be the major controversy for dealing with the resurrection. But there's another debate that is much more significant, namely the timing of our resurrection. As mentioned above, most Christians anticipate a general resurrection on the last day, when all the dead will be raised together. However, some Christians, including a few within the evangelical camp, have suggested otherwise. They maintain that physical death is followed by an immediate resurrection. For some, the logic is that death takes us outside the present space-time universe and thus ushers us instantly to the last day. Thus understood, there really is no temporal gap between the moment of die death and the day of resurrection. Hence, in this sense, we can speak in terms of an immediate resurrection, like time travelers, the dead are instantly shunted forward to the last day. It's like soul sleep on steroids, only there isn't any soul involved. <laughs> you die, and you're resurrected in the same non-temporal instant, or whatever a non-temporal equivalent of an instant happens to be. <laughs> but this idea of an immediate resurrection has also been defended on the grounds that there's really no material continuity between the physical mortal body that we presently live in and the glorified immortal body that we will receive at the point of death. Unlike Jesus, the particles of our physical bodies will gradually disintegrate, so long as we're not cannibalized or vaporized first. Anyway, the gist of the argument is simply this. There's nothing of our physical bodies that will ultimately survive for God to resurrect. Unlike Humpty Dumpty, there'll be nothing for God to put back together again. <laughs> Accordingly, there's no reason to object to the idea of an immediate resurrection at death itself, whereby we receive our immortal body there and then. We don't have to wait until the final day. Indeed, according to these scholars, the Apostle Paul has clearly adopted such an understanding by the time that he wrote 2 Corinthians. Well, that's the focus of Tuesday's lecture, resurrection, the ultimate makeover, question mark. The third issue we're going to focus on relates to the question of final judgment, in particular the idea of judgment according to works. The biblical testimony concerning the prospect of a final eschatological judgment is not in doubt. However, there is a marked difference in how the significance of such a judgment for Christians should be understood. For some, the final judgment for Christians is conceived in terms of a, a graduation ceremony, if you like, simply involving the conferral or the withholding of heavenly rewards. A well done with eternal prizes for some, and a divine rebuke with the loss of said rewards for others. At the other extreme are those who understand the last judgment for Christians in terms of final justification and salvation. It suggested that while initial justification is by faith, final justification will be by works. Thus, works are the decisive, indeed, the determining factor in God's ultimate verdict on the last day. Indeed, without such works, personal salvation will actually be forfeited. Between these two extremes lie a whole host of other perspectives. For some, works will simply serve as the evidence of genuine faith, 
They'll show that the faith that we've professed was living and active rather than one that's merely cerebral and, and dead. Others have adopted a position rather similar to the Roman Catholic one mentioned above, suggesting that on the last day, Christian deeds will be the primary grounds for God's final verdict. So what is the relationship between works and Christian standing, Christian status, on the last day? That's the can of worms we're opening on Wednesday's lecture when we consider judgment, the ultimate verdict, question mark. The fourth issue relates to a much more emotive and difficult topic. The classical and evangelical view of hell is that of eternal conscious torment. Now, there are differences over how various biblical images of hell should be understood, whether literally or figuratively, and over the nature of the suffering that's involved. Is it bodily suffering or psychological suffering or whatever? But hell has generally been perceived as a place of conscious punishment that endures forever. Not surprisingly, many, such, many find such a thought deeply disturbing. Indeed, there's probably something wrong with you if you don't find such a thought deeply disturbing. But while some may be repelled mainly by the, the grotesque depictions outside of Scripture, for others, the traditional interpretation of biblical imagery is equally repugnant. But today, it's not just liberals or skeptics who are questioning the traditional doctrine. A growing number of evangelicals now think of hell in terms of terminal punishment. This is the belief that the lost are simply annihilated, either at death itself or shortly after final judgment. Eternal judgment is thus understood as death and destruction. It's argued that A, biblical texts describing eternal judgment have traditionally been misinterpreted. B, that consistent judgment motifs throughout the Bible, such as death, and perishing, and destruction, and so on, have unfortunately been ignored. C, that the fact that only God is immortal and that human immortality is a divine gift has been completely overlooked. And D, that a doctrine that is so patently unjust, i.e. infinite punishment for finite sin, cannot be theologically defended or adequately explained. Now these are obviously serious allegations to which a response is clearly demanded. So in third, Thursday's lecture, we will focus on the exegetical case as we explore the nature of hell, the ultimate holocaust, question mark. The final issue we'll be considering is arguably one of the most important given what's potentially at stake the prospect of heaven as the ultimate destiny of all. In popular thought, heaven is a metaphysical realm inhabited by God and angels to which most people hope to go when they die. This is the common perception in Christian circles also. From an early age, heaven's presented as the most desirable destiny for any right-thinking person. It's where Jesus is right now, and it's where those who trust in him will go once they die. Indeed, most Christians probably think of heaven as the ultimate destiny for God's people, the place where we will spend all eternity. In recent times, this popular notion has been called into question, not by those who don't believe in God or don't believe in heaven, but by those who do. The main reason for denying that heaven will be our eternal home is simply this. It's because such an idea is allegedly contrary to the teaching of Scripture. The Bible holds out the prospect of heaven on earth, where God will come to live with us, not vice versa. And I still remember my initial shock as a young Christian when I came across that idea in Anthony Houkema's The Bible and the Future. See, the only people I'd ever heard saying anything like this before were Jehovah Witnesses. So I initially responded somewhat cautiously to Hakima's take on this. But more recently, Tom Wright and many others have popularized this idea. So it's no longer quite so radical as it once was, at least in Christian scholarly circles or among theological students. I'm not too sure about the Christians in the pew. However, another proposal, one that I think is conceptually related, has been advocated by some evangelicals in recent years. 
This is the idea that such heaven on earth is the ultimate destiny, not just for some people, but for absolutely everyone. Just as God doesn't give up on his creation, but is going to renew and restore it in the end, so also God is not going to give up on those he has created, but will ultimately restore them through Christ to be the people that he intended them to be. Evangelical universalists thus argue along the following lines. God is love. God is love. And they emphasize that. And so he wants to save all humanity, all his creation, all his creatures. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. Being omnipotent, being all powerful, God is able to save all humanity. So he can do what he wants to do. See, a number of New Testament texts imply or suggest that God will save everyone, that everyone will be reconciled. D, God's judgments throughout Scripture are primarily restorative rather than retributive. In other words, God wants to restore things, even through judgment. He's not just interested in, in dishing out just punishment for punishment's sake. E, God's love demands and his severe mercy, which is code word for his wrath, requires that even punishment in hell is ultimately restorative. F, the idea of post-mortem repentance and salvation from hell is not explicitly denied in scripture. Indeed, it can be inferred from a number of biblical texts such as Revelation 21, verse 25. Once again, a gauntlet has been thrown down that demands a response. Thus, in our final lecture, we'll critically examine some of the exegetical arguments used to defend evangelical universalism as we consider the topic, heaven, the ultimate destination, question mark. So, now you know where we're headed, for the next week at least. I'm tempted to say what happens. <laughs> oh, you're still awake, good. I'm tempted to say that what happens hereafter is anyone's guess. But well, that's not really true. As we've seen, there are and always have been any number of ideas and suggestions. But these are not all equally valid or authoritative. Some are clearly just the stuff of, of myth and legend. Some just the musings of mere men, in some cases very intelligent men, but men nonetheless, men who have contemplated the, the meaning of life, the grim reality of death, and the hope of things to come. But in the case of scripture, we have more than just the musings of mere men. Here we have the revelation of God himself, progressively revealed to human beings, and thus an authoritative insight into death and the afterlife. Now clearly there are significant differences in opinion with, with respect to the Bible's eschatology, such as true among religious people in general, but it's also true these days among those who wholeheartedly accept the teaching of the Bible and who unreservedly submit to its authority. However, while this is undeniably so, it's not a reason for despair. For all the differences of opinion, there are several facts about which we can be absolutely certain. While death concludes a significant chapter in our existence, it's clearly not the end. In one, in one sense, it's the end of the beginning. It's the climax, the personal climax to the, the biblical narrative that begins in the early chapters of Genesis. But death is also the beginning of the end. It ushers us into the eschatological realities to which the Bible also points us. The prospect of life after death, an existence beyond the grave. The prospect of physical resurrection and final judgment. The prospect of eternal life in the presence of God. Or a second death with the devil and his angels. However we interpret the details of these eschatological realities, we can be absolutely sure. And we must therefore take them with all the seriousness that scripture commends. Life after death is a biblical truth, but it's a truth that the Bible tells us we should take on board now in this life 
before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken and dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Whatever death and the afterlife may entail, it's something we should prepare for now. And in this important respect, all who accept the biblical testimony are in absolute agreement. For in this, the Bible is crystal clear. People are destined to die once and after death to face judgment. Well, we'll give Paul a moment to just catch his breath, um, and then we've got about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, if you raise your hand, we'll give you a microphone, and I will try to summarise your question uh, so for the microphone here, so that hopefully uh, that also gives Paul just a little bit more time to think of the answer. So is there anybody uh, who would like to ask, start us off and ask a question of Paul? We have a question down here. Hold on, there's a microphone coming up to you. Sorry. Is, is there something that perhaps we should be reading before listening to uh, your further lectures? So a question about reading as we prepare to listen to the rest of the series. Um, I'm sure there is the Bible, uh, <laughs> <laughs> number one. Uh, not really. Like I was really trying to set the, the foundation as tonight uh, so you know where we're going. Um, like there, there are numerous books that deal with different views on these things, so that might be a place you might, might want to look at some of the uh, Zondervan do these counterpoint series, four views on, so there's a, interestingly, there's, there's one now, four views on hell, uh, a second edition, uh, came out, I think, about March this year. Uh, the original edition came out 20 years ago, and it's just interesting to compare the two uh, to see how things have changed in the past 20 years, because there's now a chapter... Uh, on purgatory. Uh, there was a chapter in purgatory in the original by a Catholic. Uh, there's a chapter in purgatory in this edition by a Protestant and evangelical. Uh, and there's a chapter on evangelical universalism, uh, which wasn't there before. <clears throat> While you're thinking of a question, I have one. Um, <laughs> And I won't have to repeat it. I can speak it straight into the microphone. Uh, Paul, when you were talking about Homer, you spoke about um, the importance of being properly buried yeah. as part of his view of uh, preparing for the afterlife. Have you thought about the connection between burial rites, very obviously with the Egyptians, of course, but um, mummification, cremation, burial, and the relation of those kinds of rites to the view of the afterlife? Um, I haven't thought a lot about it, but uh, I think it does reflect a, a difference in opinion. Uh, like Traditionally, Judeo-Christians buried their dead uh, in the hope of resurrection, uh, whereas Romans uh, uh, incinerated their dead uh, with this idea that the, the soul is going immediately up uh, into some heavenly place and doesn't want to come back again. Uh, so I think, that, that's sort of the, I think that's what you're getting at. Mm. Thank you. Bill. I'm interested in the, uh, just the, the survey of the uh, cultures show there's a relationship between maybe a, a culture and their view of death. Uh, have you got any thoughts on uh, the, the shift that you've noted in the evangelical world? Are there cultural factors in that which might be affecting that movement? So a question about cultural factors affecting the movement in the evangelical perspective uh, on these questions. Um. I haven't thought much about it, Bill, but um, I think, unfortunately, sometimes the guys who I'm going to be critiquing and interacting with uh, are um, accused of sort of going soft on these things. Uh, and I don't think they're going soft on anything. I don't agree with them, but I think it's very unfair to, to suggest that there's this cultural shift from you know, to this hard line evangelicalism to a much softer approach and they don't like the idea of, of hell and anything like that. Uh, I think that's an unfair criticism. Uh, I think that the main thing that seems to be motivating a lot of them is looking back at scripture 
which is why I say uh, these guys are uh, bona fide evangelicals, even though I don't agree with them. Uh, I wouldn't want to uh, say they're not evangelical in their perspective. They clearly are. Um. I'm sure there's lots of other questions that uh, that we might be uh, thinking of as the series proceeds. Um, we've got after uh, after I was going to say afternoon tea. We've got supper actually. It's a little bit later than that, isn't it? We've got supper downstairs, which I hope that you'll stay and enjoy with us and uh, perhaps chew over some of those things that uh, Paul has mentioned. Uh, we just had a taste of what's going to be a really very very significant series of lectures. I think um, what has impressed me so far is that Paul has shown us he's not afraid of asking the hard questions and addressing them, and he's going to be doing that over the next week. I should tell you that the next of these lectures then uh, occurs on Monday at 10am right here, 10am uh, Monday in this place, and it's not just for students and members of the college community, we'd love to have visitors join us at, at that point, but uh, please uh, feel free to come on Monday and hear the first, or the first of the daytime lectures and the second in this series. Uh, will you join me uh, with thanking Paul again for this inaugural lecture?